All right, let's get started then. All right, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's nice to see this audience to learn more about uh, Deck General Plus. So my name is uh, Tiago Mundt. I'm a developer marketing manager at Nordic Semiconductor. I'm part of the product marketing team, and I'm here to talk to you guys today about uh, Deck General Plus, which is the first non-seller 5G standard. And throughout this presentation, I'll go and explain what that means exactly. So the agenda for the next 30 minutes or so, I'll give everyone an introduction about Nordic Semiconductor, for those of you who might not be familiar with our company. Then we'll have uh, an overview of Deck General Plus from a technical standpoint. Of course, time is limited, so we can't go into a lot of details there. And then we'll look at some of the applications, which are uh, strong contenders to be used for uh, with Deck General Plus. And then we'll wrap up with um, what Nordic is offering within this space. All right. So. Introduction to Nordic Semiconductor. We are a fabulous semiconductor company, um, moving actually to more of IoT solutions. Based out of Norway, our headquarters is up there in uh, Trondheim. We have a global footprint, so we have offices all over the world. Most of our R&D uh, is based in Europe, a lot of it in Norway, Finland, and some other countries across, across Europe. We were founded in 1983, so we're actually celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. We currently have about 1,200 employees, about two-thirds uh, of that, almost more than two-thirds of that uh, is R&D. And we are a leading uh, provider of ultra-low power or wireless connectivity solutions uh, that have a portfolio spanning from short range to long range um, devices and, and, and solutions. And within the IoT space, you can't just sell silicon anymore because you need to have, uh, you know, SDK. You need to have connectivity stacks, and of course, you need to have, uh, you know, advanced development tools that can help customers build devices and get them to market fast. So our uh, products are enabled by a unified uh, software platform, a unified SDK, that brings together all of these wireless connectivity into a unified solution that customers can use to build their application. And we're also very well known for our, our support, uh, you know. Uh, leading excellent support uh, on our dev zone. So uh, Nordic started, like I said, in 1983. It was a uh, design company doing mostly ASICs. And then it moved on to making on products. So these were uh, wireless transceivers for proprietary applications in a 2.4 gigahertz band. And then the big, big breakthrough for Nordic really came with the Bluetooth LE introduction. That was around 2010. So we are, uh, you know, we have the largest market share in uh, Bluetooth uh, LE uh, chips, uh, and that comes. That's where our first, we're the first, or one of the first, if not the first company, to come to market with uh, a wireless SoC for Bluetooth LE. So at the time, you would implement wireless connectivity. You would have uh, a host device, whether it was an MCU or an application processor, and then you would bring wireless through a transceiver. And Nordic put this together into a single SoC. So you would have the radio, and then you would have also onboard CPU. It was an ARM Cortex-M0 at the time, but also other resources like flash, RAM, peripherals. So you'd make designs a lot more compact and reduce the cost of implementing wireless, wireless connectivity. Uh, currently, our short-range offering is not just Bluetooth LE anymore. Of course, we also support uh, some of the 802.15.4 standards like Zigbee and Thread. Matter, which is a standard uh, that is coming in the smart home space. And we have also recently launched our first Wi-Fi 6 device. That was in February this year. It's a Wi-Fi companion device, so it's not an SOC like the short-range devices. It needs to be coupled with a host device, so you can use one of the short-range devices that we have, bring uh, the Wi-Fi connectivity separately and get the Wi-Fi 6 enabled device. If you're doing Matter product, for example, uh, you can run it on either Thread or Wi-Fi, so that's a very powerful combination. And then around 2018, we came into the cellular space as well. So that is where IoT came into cellular with L LTEM and NB-IoT, which enabled cellular connectivity on devices that have very constrained energy budgets. So you can have better operated cellular devices to implement things like sensors or devices out there that you cannot plug to a mains power. And now we also have DECT in our plus, which is the topic of this presentation. So you might see this with a few different names. The formal specification name is DECT 2020 NR. That was the name used by uh, Etsy, uh, which made the radio specification. DECT NR plus is, as you've guessed, the marketing name. 
Uh, NR stands for new radio, and the plus sort of uh, signals the new opportunities that this uh, new radio technology brings and the new applications that it may unlock. And you know how it is with uh, standards. Uh, probably many of you have seen this meme. The thing about standards is that there's never enough of them, right? You can always have plus one. And that is true for many things, from chargers uh, to messaging platforms, social media platforms, and especially wireless protocols. Uh, so you, you take the standards you have, you try to create a universal standard, you get everything you had, plus one more. That is not exactly the situation within R+. So we're not trying to make people's life more complicated. So for a bit of background, uh, DECT has been around for around 30 years, and it stands for Digitally Enhanced uh, Cordless Telecommunications. So this is the technology that is used in cordless phones that people used to have in, at their homes, office spaces, but now we all carry smartphones in our pockets. So the cordless phones started you know, disappearing. And there's a spectrum out there that can be used. It's in the 1.9 gigahertz band. And so there is an opportunity to leverage state-of-the-art uh, technologies, uh, techniques from, from cellular and create a new radio specification that could leverage this existing spectrum. It also comes and fills a big gap in IoT that can enable applications that were not possible with other wireless protocols. So there are two things about Dectinero Plus. It's the first non-cellular 5G standard. Let's maybe start with a 5G part. So 5G is owned by the ITU. That is the International Telecommunications Union. And what it does is that it sets requirements and guidelines. And then there will be um, radio access technologies coming that will meet those requirements. So it kind of creates uh, a stack. So at the top, you have these requirements from the ITU. And then you had the 3GPP come in and developed the 5G NR. NR also standing for new radio. This is the one that mo people are most familiar with. This is the one that we carry in our pockets, in our smartphones, and also developed LTEM and NB-IoT radio access. And the ETSI developed then this DECT 2020 NR standard, and this was adopted by the ITU as a 5G standard in 2022. And the question is why? Why did a non-cellular standard, which is something I'll explain later, why did it get adopted by the ITU as a 5G standard? And the reason is that in that document of requirements, there are three key application areas that those uh, radio access technologies need to address. At the top there, we have EMBB. That stands for Enhanced Mobile Broadband. This, again, goes to what we have in our smartphones. This is all about you know, high data rates, you know, media, VR, gaming, these type of applications. Then on this side here, we have MMTC, standing for Massive Machine Type Communication. This is all about scale, thousands, millions of nodes, sending data, sensors, all types of machines, talking to each other, talking to the cloud. Use cases there, smart energy, smart city, agriculture, healthcare, a lot of places where you can deploy these types of devices. And then on the other side, you have the ultra reliability, low latency communications. So the requirements are in the name itself. We're talking about safety critical, mission critical applications that require really low latency, down to one millisecond at the radio level. So here we're talking about uh, smart, um, smart industry, you know, industrial IoT, where you have uh, robots, self-driving vehicles that need to talk to each other in real time. So it needs to be extremely robust and it needs to be extremely low latency. And those radio access technologies that I showed in the previous slide, they map to these use cases. So the 5G near radio can comply with a use case for enhanced mobile broadband, as well as the ultra reliability. Then you have NBIoT and LTM on the massive machine type communication. And then you have NR+. And NR+, can also cover use cases on the two lower uh, sites. So on the massive machine type and the ultra reliability of latency communication. And this is why it was adopted in 2022 as a 5G standard. Some of the key features of that NR Plus. So the two first one is that it's a self-healing decentralized network. What this means is that there is no uh, central point of authority in the network. There's no routing tables. All the decisions are made at the device level. 
And it's self-healing, meaning that it allows for devices to be mobile, to move around the network, and the network can adapt really quickly because of the reliability aspect. It can adapt very quickly to these changes to make sure that all devices are connected, are in the network at any given point in time. And then moving uh, to a little bit different topic, it's also, and this is very important uh, for product manufacturers, it is uh, license exempt We're using a global spectrum. What this means in practice is that you as a product maker, you can create one product and deploy it globally instead of having to create products that have some regional variation to comply with the different regulations and the different spectrum license that you might need to have on these different places. And then, of course, the ultra latency aspect to comply with the use case from the 5G and the scalability aspect as well. If you want to cover a one square kilometer area using Dectinar Plus devices, you can start with as little as 100 devices, scale that to 1 million devices. In fact, the network theoretical upper limit is 4 billion, which is you know, only a theoretical limit, but of course it gives you a sense of the scale you can get using this technology. And for device makers, this brings two key benefits. One thing I haven't talked about yet, which is of course cost, because as you saw, NB-IoT and LTM can also address uh, the massive machine type communication. But you know they come with SIM cards, they come with data plans. Dectinar Plus is to deploy private networks, which means that you're not relying on cellular infrastructure. So you remove the need for base stations, you don't need a SIM card, and you're not bound to any kind of data subscription plans. And when you remove these boundaries out, it means that you have much easier installation of these devices, and the cost of maintaining these networks is much lower. And then the scalability and reliability also eliminates uh, single points of failure. It's autonomous, as I mentioned, self-healing. It scales. Uh, you can add more devices to the network in a seamless way. It has security built into the standard itself. So this is extremely important. In many of these applications that I mentioned in healthcare and in industry, you don't want your data uh, to be, you know, you don't want anyone to, an attacker to eavesdrop on your data. So it has security built in over the air updates, and as I already hinted towards some of the numbers, you can scale, for example, from 100 nodes up to a million nodes within one square kilometer. So the devices will be able to adjust, for example, uh, the tr transmission power dynamically to avoid overhearing so that you can really implement very, very high density networks. So what the deck band uh, looks like on the world map. So the, the major markets uh, are covered in North America, most of Europe, with a few exceptions, South America, and then the two regions that, uh, that are still missing is uh, India and China. In India, the classic DECT is approved, but there's still work ongoing to get approval for DECT General Plus within this 1.9 gigahertz uh, band. And in China, the band is currently allocated to a local uh, telecommunication operator. Uh, but there is an industry consortium called the DECT Forum. Uh, so the Etsy specifies the radio, um, the radio part, and the DECT Forum drives more like business development certification programs, as well as trying to explore with the local regulators how to expand the markets in which the technology can be uh, deployed uh, in a license-exempt manner. So going a bit deeper into the technical side, uh, these are terminologies that you might find in other uh, mesh technologies. You know, they might have go by different names. But in Dectinar Plus, uh, the, the sort of the root of your network is what's called a sync device. So this is the gateway. Uh, if you were using thread, you would call this a border router. So it's a similar concept. So you'll have a Dectinar Plus interface, and then you'll have a backend, a backhaul to the internet, which can be Wi-Fi, could be Ethernet, or it could be also 5G cellular. Then you'll have relay devices, so they're basically extending the reach of your network, bridging data between the other devices in the Dectinar Plus uh, network. And then your end devices would be the leaf nodes. So these are devices that essentially uh, produce and consume data. So they can send data up to the sink to be sent over to the internet, or they may receive data that's being sent from elsewhere through the sink into the network. Uh, a device doesn't have to be exclusively a relay or exclusively a leaf. It really is mostly a functionality, so you can combine that and have, if a leaf also has the ability to uh, route messages, it can also be combined into a single device. And you can do point-to-point -point communication. So Dectinar Plus also supports um, uh, audio, audio streaming. Uh, so that would be in a point-to-point -point communication. Uh, then star and mesh topology are the most 
the most common ones that we see customers being uh, interested in, in deploying out there. So how the, um, how the standard works is, is a bit like uh, putting Legos together. So Deck Neural Plus defines different features, but it's mostly at the application level or at what they call profile level that the different features get selected in a way that best suits that profile, the needs of that profile. So what that means is that in general, there is no interoperability standard. Everything will get done at this profile level. So it will be very specific to device networks. So there's work on going to define these profiles, for example, for smart metering and for other applications. And within the profiles, you'll have the interoperability uh, that define how, how these devices need to talk to each other. So the key applications for DECT NR Plus, we kind of touched some of them already, but there's three main application areas. The first one is industrial IoT. So here we're talking about large factories, warehouses, where you have different types of devices moving around. This is actually a very challenging uh, environment, if you think about it. You'll have a lot of, uh, well, first of all, you, have, you might have long distances. You will have devices moving around, objects, metal objects, uh, you know, reflections. So there's really no wireless technology that can go today and replace a lot of these cabled applications that you have in factories. And of course, while complying with ultra low latency requirements and the reliability requirements of having a cable. Then you have uh, smart cities, and smart cities is more on the scale of things. You can start by deploying a few devices and you want your network to grow seamlessly as you add more devices. You don't want to have to introduce more networks uh, into, into, into your deployment. So we're talking about smart street lighting, you know, parking sensors, bin sensors, traffic management, uh, all kinds of uh, things that you need uh, in, in a smart city deployment. And then also professional audio um, is another area of application, but at least initially now for Nordic, these are the two or areas that we are uh, focusing on. So industrial IoT and on smart city. So in industrial IoT, you will have a lot of different devices, right? So you'll have uh, of course, you'll have backends and so on, so you'll need a sync device that can talk to those. But you will have, you know, uh, access control, you might have vehicles, you'll have robots, you'll have automation, you'll have, you'll be tracking objects, people. So there's a massive amount of connected equipment. Some of those will have uh, low latency requirements. And this is something you can sort of mix and match within a single Dectin Plus network. So some ports of that can be built for scale, but you know that there's some other devices that have very strict low latency requirements and the network can accommodate and it can prioritize devices and traffic based on those requirements so that you know that you'll have the low latency requirements that you need, they will be fulfilled, but also the scalability side will be fulfilled. And then the self-healing and self-organizing properties are really important because all of those objects are very are very mobile and you want to make sure that as they move around, they don't lose the connectivity at any given point in time. And again, security and privacy are very important in this kind of uh, scenario. For smart cities, the most common application that we see today customers being interested on is smart lighting. So, you know, it's, it's a big uh, source of energy drain. So if you can control the lights, do dynamic control, turn them on only when, when needed, when there's cars, when there's people. That's, that's of course, a, a huge value proposition. And once you start with that kind of network, you can, of course, expand and add other devices. You can add all kinds of sensors, EV charging spots. Uh, you can even put, for example, speakers if you want uh, for announcements in your city. Uh, so it, it grows very seamlessly. And then on the back end, for a smart city deployment, normally you would have a 5G uh, back end, so LTM or, or NB IoT. So where Nordic uh, stands when it comes to uh, Dectinar Plus offering. So we currently, or until about three weeks ago, we had one product in our seller portfolio called the NRF 9161. And we have recently announced an expansion to this portfolio. So we have announced new products in the NRF 91 series that have Dectinar Plus support. So the NRF 9160, the existing seller product, cannot support Dectinar Plus, but the new products will support it. And we've been working very closely with Wirepass. This is a company in Finland. Uh, they have a um, full solution for Dectinar Plus. So the Nordic will provide the hardware for customers, and then customers will get the software for Wirepass to start developing with Dectinar Plus. So Wirepass has a 
yet another name for a deck neuroplast. They call it 5G mesh, but again, it means the exact same thing. So it's the exact same radio access protocol. And we're also working with uh, some early access customers when it comes to the ultra low latency uh, use case, uh, as well as the, the audio streaming uh, use case. And that is not with, with wireless, uh, with WirePass. So WirePass is focusing on the massive machine type communication use case. That is what their stack has been um, built to accommodate. So the first device that we announced is the NRF 9161. This is a system and package. It's not just the SOC. So it contains the, of course, it has the SOC at the core, but it also has uh, product management IC. It has passives and crystal and the front end module uh, all in one package. And it contains an ARM Cortex M M33 uh, application processor. So traditionally, seller was done so that you would have an application processor and you would bring a seller modem separately and you would have an AT command interface. This puts all in one. So your application can run in this device. You don't need a separate host to run your application. So there's a dedicated application core and then they will have the seller modem with its own resources contained within that device. So it's very small form factor, includes uh, all the components that I mentioned, PMIC, RF front end, passives and crystals, operates from three volts to 5.5 volts. And we have, of course, kits available. You can see them at our booth. We're at booth number eight, if you want to follow up afterwards. So we have the 9161 uh, development kit uh, for firmware development. That's the blue PCB that you guys see there. And we have also for prototyping a platform called the Thingy. So this brings the module uh, plus sensors. And this one also brings a, a Wi-Fi for Wi-Fi locationing. Uh, it brings a 5340, which was on one of our short range devices. Uh, if you want to have also Bluetooth LE connectivity there to a mobile phone. Uh, and it puts it everything into a very small compact device also with the battery, which you can charge through our PMIC. So it's something you can also use for uh, field trials and, and deployments. And last thing before I forget, it's also pre-certified. So if you're a customer, you don't have to worry about the certification side. You get that with the module itself. Uh, the other device was the 9131, uh, uh, called it Mini SIP. So this is a shrunk down version of, of the other module. And the reason why it's shrunk down is because we took out the power management IC and the, the crystals and the passive. And it's also not pre-certified. So it's 50% smaller, it's 50% of the size of the other module, 20% uh, height reduction compared to the other module. Uh, but it is still software and feature compatible. So you have all the features that you have on the other one. If you run, uh, develop your software on the 9161, you can run it on the 9131 as well. So it, this is a good for, fit for uh, Deck General Plus, but for seller products, it's something that uh, we, we, um, we sort of guide customers who are in the high volume space where they can run their own certification instead of getting a pre-certified module. Uh, but to help customers, you also have a full reference design. So there's a bill of materials there. Uh, and this is to support them in making sure that their design is uh, as robust as possible uh, and to sort of limit the scope of what they need to do because they will already inherit a lot of, a lot of the design from, from Nordic. And for this, we also have uh, development hardware, evaluation kit, and you can also use, like I mentioned, because of the software compatibility and the feature compatibility, uh, you can use the 9161 development kit uh, and then move over to the 31 when you go into your own design, when you go into production. Yeah, I think, well, so I'm going to my uh, last slide uh, before we can open up for questions. Just to summarize what we learned today, so DECTNR Plus, um, this is the first non-seller 5G network. So it was uh, adopted by the ITU as a 5G standard because it fulfills uh, the key use cases defined in the IMT 2020 document non-seller because you don't rely on seller operators. You don't need a base station, you don't need seller infrastructure, you don't need a SIM card, and you don't need any kind of data subscription. You can deploy a private network with this technology. It's on the 1.9 gigahertz global um, spectrum, license exempt, supporting star and mesh network topologies. The two key application areas are for massive machine type IoT communication and ultra reliability, low latency communication, and it's built on proven cellular technologies by billions of devices out in the field, many of those that we carry in our pockets. And I think we can now, I've learned to ask who has the first question and not are there any questions. And uh, I see many hands up, so that's a good sign. Yeah. 
so when it comes to the uh, Tech 2000 and R, um, other than Wirepass, are there any uh, other initiatives that are more close to the open source area? Is it integrated with Zephyr, for example? And N not that I know at the moment, but I, I guess that might be the direction. If you look at how other standards have evolved over time, yeah. at, at some point there might be open source implementations. And one sure. thing that uh, maybe I uh, wasn't yeah. fully clear is that these are for customers who want to get started now. They okay. want to deploy Vector R Plus or they want to create products and evaluate it today. They can yeah. go to Airbus. But they can get the, the Phi API from us and also implement the lower layers of the stack and put, for example, IPv6 running on top of that. Because Vector R Plus does not define an application layer. It only defines the four lower layers. And then you can yeah. bring your application as an existing uh, wireless uh, networking protocol. Understood. Um, maybe a quick one. Uh, how do you price it today? I mean, the software, is it is it directly with Wirepass or is it with... Uh directly with Wirepass. Okay. Yeah. So hardware from Nordic, software from Wirepass, and they have their own licensing uh, model for their software. Understood. Yeah. Yeah, there are a few more questions. I saw at least yeah. four hands. Yeah, it's, it's open. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah my name is uh, Juan Nogueira. I'm... Mm, I have been working in, in with DEC um, eight years ago. Actually, we we developed the first smart home solution using DEC um, at that time, you know. And the benefit of uh, choosing DEC um, at that time was instead of other um, uh, you know um, existing um, technologies uh, for the smart home was the the um, the license, you know, 1.9 as mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, gigahertz, which is a license for that. So there was no competition for other devices but uh, another one was the, the the output power so you can transmit up to five 500 millivolts output power so the range is really um, interesting right so now I see that uh, you have moved uh, you have changed the, the let's say the topology which was based in an access point plus uh, there was a star topology at that time you know mm -hmm. that was the interesting one so now it's a kind of mesh network but I think you are not using the 500 milliwatt output power possibilities on, on your chip. I, I, that's, that's right, yeah? Uh, so the, the, when we have been prototyping that Kinar Plus already, and I think the most, the highest tech, TX power has been 19 dBm. I'm not exactly sure how much that is in, in milliwatts. But the standard as such can go up to 23, if I remember correctly. 27, I think. It can be, yeah. I, I Maybe the know. legacy deck, but Dekner Plus, the numbers I've seen are 23. And you talked about range. So, of course, I didn't give a lot of data when it comes to uh, range or throughput or things like that. Uh, because, of course, we have sort of limited, uh, you know, limited field trials. But in terms of range, we have reached close to 5 kilometers line of sight. And when it comes to throughput, uh, we are uh, doing at around 3 megabits. So the standard as such can go to g uh, gigabits per second, but we're, f of course, focusing on the IoT, which yeah, doesn't yeah. have that kind of requirement. But, but how, how much is the output power you, you provide on your chipset? Uh, it's I think it's 19 dBm also on these. I'm not sure if 19 it's here, dBm. Okay. but that's something you can probably see from the website. I'm sorry that it's not mentioned here, but I think it's around 19 dBm. Okay, and the other question is, I mean, you focus in, in, in industrial applications, which I think is a, is a good uh, area for, for that. But um, are you not planning to to you know to release uh, only an R plus chip? I mean, for most of the applications, I do not need to add uh, LTE, uh, GNSS, mm -hmm. and R-band IoT in, in 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 an IoT device which is going to run in in a factory. You know, I right. just need to to have uh, the connection internally a mesh and maybe a gateway that to to connect to the Ethernet of the rest of the factory network. So yeah. I think this is a waste of money. You know, on on. On that, on that, yeah. That's true. So you only need, you. at the minimum, of course, you need one sync device to provide that connectivity. You can have more sync devices for redundancy. Uh, I can't really comment on roadmap, but I'll just say that what you said does make sense. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe there. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, oh, sorry, you, you have the microphone. You asked all the <laughs> question I was going to ask. So I was going to ask about the range. So you said five kilometers line yes, of sight? Yes, we have tested uh, up five kilometers uh, in line of sight what between two devices without hops. Okay. So if you if you say that that device is a relay, then you can have another one five kilometers further. What if it's not line of sight? Can that becomes more complicated, yeah. as you can imagine, because if it's not line of sight, then there's a, you know an infinity of scenarios of, yeah. you know, we have one wall, two walls, is it metal, is it... Uh, but 
ballpark if you're talking about a factory environment mm. it's hundreds of meters yeah but that's very highly dependent on the environment and it's not just about it's not just about objects also about the layout so there's many mm. then you go into an environment that a lot of factors can influence range which it's difficult to give uh, uh, figures on that which will influence the data rate of course sorry which will influence by default, the data rate, of course. So the you said three megabytes yes. per second? Actually, no. So the, the data rate needs to be kept across the distance, which is one uh. thing that's different from other wireless technologies. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> one of the capabilities of, of WirePass is uh, positional data. So right. how, how does that, because of course, your bigger distances between devices positional data becomes more complicated. Is that, do you have a comment on that? Actually, I, I don't actually know how they will adapt that to Dexner Plus. So that's something I, a uh, topic that I cannot really uh, address. Maybe that's something to ask to our I'll, I'll ask them directly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> there. One there and there's there as well. I have a one minute. Uh, one minute, <laughs> oh, okay. Hi. Um, Hi. Two questions. One, if you're using as a leaf device, yep. uh, is it suitable for wearable applications? So, sort of, what's the power consumption? And then the second is, with this particular SIP package, can it run the DEC 2020 and cellular? As in, can it multiplex? So, uh, yes, you can. So, if you're doing a device, if you're doing the sync, you can you can use this device as a sync as because you have yeah. Technar Plus. And then you have the backhaul connectivity to the internet. So that was question number two. Uh, number one was about uh, the low power, right? Yeah, so if yep. you use it for a wearable device. Right. Uh, so uh, as a leaf device, you can sleep for longer periods of time. Uh, actually, even as a relay device, uh, relay devices can also sleep. That's one thing that this technology is a little bit different from the mesh technology that, that are more prevalent, like thread and these sort of things, where a relay device need to be mains powered. They need to be on all the time. Actually, relays can inform the leaves ahead of time when they will be available so that the leaves know when to wake up and contact the, and, and send it to the relay. The only thing that the leaves need to listen to is for sort of pings or like beacons from the relay. Uh, and those beacons will inform the leaf when there's data coming to them so they can wake up. I don't remember the periods, but they can go from a few seconds to many you know minutes where you can be in sleep mode without having to use the radio. So you, you go to, you know, Microamp level current consumption, and it does enable battery power devices like like wearable devices. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have time for one more? Or no, I think we're over time. Oh, okay. Answer the question. Great. Okay, I think that was the last one then. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank you.